Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the C-Squared Podcast. We have another recap for you today. It's day three at the World Championship match in Astana, Kazakhstan, between Nepomniashi and Ding Liren. And what a day it was. Nepomniashi with the white pieces, some early pressure on. Ding was fighting it off. A lot of excitement in the opening. A lot of new information is uh, coming out from this match and from both of these players camp uh, through the opening choice so a lot to discuss and the press conference I have to say I've watched it recently was quite interesting as well we will be discussing that in just a second let's get straight into it Fabi take it away let's get into the analysis yeah so it was an interesting game from a theoretical point of view, for sure. So Jan played the first move, d4. A deviation from what we saw in his first game, in the first game of the match, where he played e4. Ding responded with the marshal, his uh, you know his normal approach to uh, combating e4. And we saw Jan have come with the idea in the anti marshal Rare idea, he got an advantage. And I would have expected, after that game, that he would try to test Ding, knowing where, where Ding wants to go after e4, or at least having a very good idea that Ding wants to stick with his with his marshal, mm -hmm. that he would continue to test Ding in some sort of anti-marshal lines. Instead, he played first move d4. Ding responded knight of 6, c4, e6. This is to be expected. Usually people don't go for the, let's say, Slav. They don't go for uh, the King's Indian, the Grunfeld. Usually they go for the Queen's Gambit declined. And yes. this is what Jan himself did, right? Yes. In that second game where we saw Ding avoid the Queen's Gambit declined lines in a very rare way with Knight of 3d5 h3. Instead, Jan tried to deviate or tried to find a uh, refuge from the Queen's Gambit in a different way. He played Knight c3 at an invitation to the Nimzo Indian. And uh, to remind our viewers, the Nimzo Indian starts after Knight c3, Bishop to b4. And this is one of the biggest complexes in modern chess. Uh, its biggest opening complex, as that is. It has an abundance of theory. White has so many moves here that we can go through briefly. Absolutely. But... Well, Fabi, you're one of uh, the experts with the black pieces. You've uh, tried this with the white pieces as well, especially in the candidates. You've done extensive preparation. Um, tell us a bit about the ins and outs of uh, the variations. Yeah, I, I do. I do feel like I know the names of quite well uh, with both colors, although not as well as some other guys like, uh, you know, let's say Wesley, for example, is uh, a diehard Nimzo player with white. Uh, Hikaru, um, Levon, like these guys know it super, super well. I think everyone is forced to know the Nimzo well because it's it's basically, if you want to pick like the biggest openings in chess, it might be like Berlin, Nimzo, Queen's Gambit, Decline, this sort of thing. So after Bishop T4, white has so many choices. So what would Jan want to do here? That's he could play queen to c2. This is one of the big um, directions for white. He could play fourth move e3. This is the Rubenstein uh, variation. Also, I would say this is the biggest direction for white. This is where most people are searching for ideas these days. Mm -hmm. Now, he could play fourth move knight to f3. This is an invitation to the Rugosum, which I think Ding does, but we don't know if he wants to do it for this match, which is... Knight of three d5 would transpose to the Rogozin by a slightly different move order. At the same time, uh, just to kind of ask you about it, if Jan does want to, actually, no, you make a lot of uh, a lot of sense because by forcing the bishop to be already on b4 and this transition to the Rogozin, you avoid all of those uh, Tarash lines with c5. Yeah, it's it, this would this move order would make sense because let's say you. Think you have some ideas in the Rogozin, but you avoid all the other Queen's Gambit decline lines, including the towers that we mentioned in the second game, that are so annoying. The thing about this is that it's not just the Rogozin. Of course, d5 is a perfectly good move. Yes. But if, if that's if you're a Rogozin player. If you're not a Rogozin player, then the move that people naturally turn to is Knight of Three Castle. Mm -hmm. And in this position, of course, White can still play e3, transposing to the Rubenstein. But if you want independent positions, then you play fifth move Bishop to g5. And this was played by Magnus Carlsen against Ding Liren in the Singfield Cup. I don't remember which year. Maybe it was 2017. Uh, maybe it was 2019. 
when the single coverage ding won, in fact. I think it might have been 2019. I, I think that's the one, yeah. And basically, black can play h6, bishop h4, and c5. And this can can go into very, very sharp theory, um, either after e3 or after rook c1. For example, I think the Carlsen game, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, was rook c1 here. Uh, c takes d4, knight takes d4, mm -hmm. d5, c takes d5. Yes. G5, bishop to G3, and queen takes D5. I remember and here Magnus game, came yeah. up with some, uh, <laughs> with some rather sharp stuff. He was basically testing, uh, testing Ding with E3. Queen takes A2, so obviously Black is grabbing a pawn, but the king is a bit airy, and then he played the move Queen to C2, I think. And uh, yeah, it was it was a sharp game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's it's definitely good for Black and Ding really defended excellently against Carlson's preparation and made a draw. So, I don't know. Would Jan have gone for some lines here? I, I generally think that White can't really create too much here. And this it's perhaps very... is going to be a question that will be answered in the next uh, game in which White uh, is uh, used by Jan, in which Jan has the white pieces, because this does seem like a direction in which he got a lot of information already. Um, Ding mentioned at the press conference that he was uh, not necessarily not ready, but he was very surprised by uh, one d4. He was expecting uh, Jan's main weapon as he framed it. He said Jan is generally um, a natural 1e4 player, uh, quite surprised that he essayed 1d4 and, you know, Jan seeing this move 3d5 and not the Nimzo, I have a feeling that, you know, despite the fact that d5 is extremely, extremely solid, it's still an option that you generally like to see whenever you're uh, playing these first three moves. Uh, would that be your consideration as well and your assessment? Yeah, I think if Jan has some sort of serious idea in the Nimzo, which he feels confident to try again, and of course, Ding would still wouldn't know where that idea is, you know, you can prepare the Nimzo all you want, but obviously White has an abundance of moves and and you're not going to predict exactly where your opponent wants to go. Yeah. Um, I would assume that Ding has prepared D5 as his main line. And because I think that if you're surprised in the opening, surprise or not, you, you still don't just start playing over the board, right? You stick to your stick to your guns. Mm -hmm. It's a world championship match. You have, you have your preparation that's been that's taken months. You stick to what you have prepared. So... We could actually see it again. We could see knight c3, d5 again. Would Ding suddenly transition to the Nimzo? Definitely also possible because you can always play the Nimzo, right? Yeah. Uh, it's You know that it's it's a good line. And even if you haven't prepared it for months, you can still play it because it's such a flexible choice. It's, it's so theoretically healthy. And it's very unlikely that you just get blown away uh, from the opening. I would be very curious to see what Jan wanted after bishop e4. I mean, is it queen to c2? Is it e3? Uh, is it maybe? Like, I don't think it would be f3 fourth move, although I played this myself and prepared this for the candidates. It's still like it gives black so much choice of good lines to play c5, d5. I mean, basically all the lines are good. So you, you need to prepare this at such a high level and with such a level of confidence that... I don't see it as super likely. And then the other option I could see as possible is the Zemish, fourth move A3, mm -hmm. bishop C3, B C3. And yeah, I don't know if I would, like, I would definitely play this line, even in a classical game. You've but done this played, recently, uh, haven't you? Uh, I don't know. I've definitely considered it. Have I, I mean, I've definitely done some random blitz games. Yeah. Have I done it in like... Uh, Without revealing too much, have you done some uh, research in, in, in this? And can you say anything about White's chances to find any sort of an edge in this idea? Oh, I mean, it's it's not revealing much to say I've researched it. Uh, so it's, you know, it's, it's a major line. A lot of people play it. For example, Magnus has some sort of uh, mini obsession with it in mm -hmm. sort of rapid and blitz games. He plays it a lot. <laughs> and the other thing is you can also play it from a Ruben sign. For example... Fourth move e3, castle. You can now play a3, and this is what the one I played a lot. Mm -hmm. Bishop c3, b c3. This one I played with with some success. Um, in only in rapid and blitz, I even played against Magnus, getting at some point during the game getting a winning position. Um, 
I've played it against quite strong players. I've played it in a match against uh, Martinez Alcantara, who is known commonly as Jospin, one of the best blitz players online and, and over the board as well. Uh, and okay, fourth move, A3. Take, take, like, rundown of the theory uh, is, okay, black can play B6. This is the modern approach. B6, I've played myself several times. I played it against Grishuk, for example, in, in a rapid one of those rapid chess championships on chess.com. Besides B6, black can definitely castle. Um, and then... And then F3, uh, this is some sort of theory. Mm -hmm. Black can play, I think it's like the old main line, C5, fifth move. Mm -hmm. And after C5, I think this is like thousands of games. C5, E3, um, castle, bishop, D3. And this is actually like a lot of Nakamura games recently, a lot of Wesley games. Um, I think there was a game like Abdul Sitar of Wesley. From and this is this... With, with, with a pawn on B6, right? No, no, without b6. So fifth move c5 after bc3. Got it. Okay. e3. Yes. Castle, bishop to d3. Okay. Knight to c6. Mm -hmm. Knight uh, to e2. Although I played knight to f3 myself, but knight to e2 is the main line. Yes. Knight to e2, b6. And then it's kind of like the old knowledge of this line is that whenever white plays e4, black plays knight to e8 to avoid getting hit with e5. And then whenever white plays f4 after that, Black tries to play f5. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think this was played Abdul Sitar of Wesley and the WR Masters, where actually Wesley was under quite a bit of pressure from a theoretical point of view. So you can look for ideas here. Yeah. Cool. Like Zemish is a place you could look, but the thing is Black does have a lot of, like besides the main lines, Black has a lot of little sidelines that are pretty good as well. None of this has happened because Ding decided to go with move 3d5. Um, C takes d5 and E takes d5, not even uh, as saying knight takes uh, d5, which is considered to be very close to equality as well. Well, I think from this move order, knight d5 is super, super risky, although for sure it does equalize eventually. Mm -hmm. But for example, knight d5, e4, knight c3, b c3, c5. And now a3 White has or some very, b1. very, yeah, rook b1, some very annoying poisonous move, rook b1. Uh, and then I remember I played this against Lenier back in the day. Bishop b7, knight f3, castle, and I think I think like Karakin won a game in 2018 candidates, which I remember very well because uh, he was starting to like catch up to me in the 2018 candidates because of this game. He beat Kramnik. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was Karakin Kramnik, and he played like h4 here. I think oh, it was wow. a novelty at the time. Uh -huh. Now the computer shows this move absolutely instantly. <laughs> but at the time, I think it was a novelty. Yeah. Uh, and then I prepared, I like prepared this myself uh, with White at some point. And I think also against Lenier, I played something very similar. Uh, let me try to remember how I played it. It was like castle, maybe bishop to d3. I think the, the knight f3 castle is already on the board. And now move nine, h4. Yeah, this, but I, I know, I think I played move 8h4 against Lenier, mm -hmm. because... Instead of knight f3. No, no, Magnus played it against Lenier. But I played something against Lenier as well. I'm not, I'll, I'll remember at some point. But yeah. Magnus played h4 against Lenier with the idea that if castle, then I think you you sometimes put your queen on g4, like h5, h6, and sometimes your queen goes to g4. Got it. Yeah, that actually, this was the game. Carlson yeah. Yeah. So, knight d5 is pretty much out of the question for a world championship match. I don't think anyone would prepare that. Got it. So ED5, it, um, this is known as Carlsbad. Uh, very, very solid. Very solid. Like, even if black accepts a tiny, tiniest worst, bit of a worse position, it's usually very, very little and sometimes not even... It's sometimes a kind of advantage which is because the computer says, like, 0.2. Yeah. And then we might think that's an advantage. But in fact, it's not really an advantage. It's just, um, yeah, the computer is kind of seeing something, but long-term, Black is doing very well. Yeah. And the other thing is that Black, even if you misplay it, somehow Black always keeps a decent position. So Bishop to G5. It's just a very solid and very compact structure, right? And yeah. 
it has been analyzed so much so deeply the strategic plans are very well understood by these top players and they also have a lot of experience in 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 this and it's difficult for white to play it's mm -hmm. actually easier for black to play from my experience really okay that's, yeah that, that's an interesting point yeah that i think is why a lot of people have gravitated towards it and it especially is connected with well, we'll go into theory, but in a with an idea that Ding Ding played in the game, which is what kind of revived it a little bit. Okay. So after Bishop G5, C6, of course, there are other moves, but C6 is a good one. E3. Here there is some sort of D, um, branch in terms of what Black wants to do. Ding played the move H6. There's also the move Bishop to F5, which is encouraging White to play Queen to F3, Bishop to G6, Bishop F6, Queen F6, Queen F6, G F6. And this endgame has been... Uh, played to death pretty much, thousands of games for sure, including recent ones, including games like Carlson once beat Kramnik in a brilliant game. Mm -hmm. Aronian Dominguez was here recently. White has a tiny advantage and a rather safe one in the end game, so it's not too much fun for black to play, but theoretically it's doing very well as well. So h6 instead, bishop h4. Now bishop f5 would be a bit of a worse version because the pawn h6 is actually a hindrance in the end game. Mm -hmm. Queen f3, bishop g6 take everything on f6, and at some point if white plays bishop to d3, then that bishop just feels a bit looser without the pawn on h7. Doesn't I don't know if that makes sense. His, his body defending him on h7. <laughs> yeah, it's just a kind of worse version with the pawn on h6, but yeah. not, not like a hugely worse one. It makes a lot of sense. So for example, if you play rook d1 or king d2, bishop d3, knight d2, knight f4, now you start seeing the pressure on the bishop uh, on g6. And if you do take on d3, you're exchanging the bishops, but you're exchanging them on my terms. Uh, as black, Yeah, if you take on the... d3, yes. it really depends on if you can achieve f5 or if white can uh, can stop that and put a knight on f5. If yeah. white puts a knight on f5, then you're basically, uh, you're in a world of hurt. Strategic if black plus. plays f5, and yeah, then maybe, maybe it also equalizes. That makes sense. Um, so anyway, Ding didn't go for that, and I understand why. He played bishop to e7, seventh move. Mm -hmm. Bishop d3, white is developing logically, castle. Queen to c2. Uh, I played knight e2 myself quite recently. I played against uh, Ali Reza Ferruja in a classical game. It's very similar to what we'd see in the game. Basically, after knight g e2, black plays rook to e8, castle, and... Um, and here black can play knight d I mean, Jeffrey played a5 against me, but I think knight d7 is a perfectly fine move. It's also a ding played, which is why I'm kind of going into this, uh, showing this direction a bit, because he played knight b to d7 in, I think it was a blitz game, in a match against uh, Alexander Grishuk. And what is the main idea for white here? Usually the main idea is to play f3 and e4. And what is the reason why this line is kind of revived? It's because at some point people realized, or probably computers realized, that after f3, black has this very strong move b5. Mm. And this yeah. idea is a very typical one these days, but it might look a bit unusual to the uninitiated to create a backwards pawn on c6. The truth is that this backwards pawn very often can anyway advance to c5, so it doesn't really become a backwards pawn. And the more important thing is that white is stopped from playing e4, so white cannot run over, over black in the center, which was the idea of f3. For example, if you play e4 here, black plays b4, knight to a4, d takes e4, f4, knight takes e4. A little tactic, and black wins a pawn, and probably the game, to be honest, at this mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. So f3 is considered maybe not the most accurate because of b5, and this, I think, was a major uh, revelation for black in the Carlsbad. Although people after f3, b5, they played bishop to f2, and it is a huge fight, of course. White, both sides have their trumps. Black will try to play b4 at some point, disturb the knight, and then break with c5 and gain a lot of activity. Against Ali Reza, instead of f3, I played the move a4. And what's the idea of a4? It's very simple. You want to play b5, I want to stop that. Mm -hmm. And now if black plays a5, then suddenly the move f3 is actually super annoying because you no longer can play b5, and e4 is very often coming. And okay, I won't get into my game against Ali Reza, but suffice to say that I got... I got an advantage, he misplayed it, and still it felt like super difficult to prove this advantage. And I never managed to really prove it in the game and eventually ended in a draw. So, And this game was from uh, Romania, right? Mm -hmm. 
And it was from Romania. If I'm not mistaken, somebody else during that day, exactly that day, played exactly this same line. I think it was a yeah. game between Van Forest and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly. Who. And Mickey Adams, you're, you're absolutely correct. Mickey Adams, yeah. But at yeah, the same time, like tournament. you played it and then Van Forest was playing it in a completely different event as well. Yeah, when you say same time, you're not exaggerating no, because it no. was literally played at the same hour, the same position. Yeah. And then I finished my game and then I checked the games from this other tournament, which was quite a strong tournament. And then I'm just like flipping through the games on my phone. And then I see the position I just had was another game. I was like, what? <laughs> on the same yeah. day? Yeah. And it basically went up to move 15, the exact same game. Yeah. yeah. Which we don't have to get into that, but both games were a draw. I mean, it shows the solidity of, uh, of the position for black. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. That even if both games white got a slight advantage, according to the computer, Black's position is pretty, pretty hard to break down. So, let's go back to what... Jan decided Jan... to play Queen C2. Queen C2, yeah. Uh, Queen C2, I mean, you can start with Knight E2, you can start with Queen C2, it will probably transpose. Mm -hmm. So, Rook to E8, Knight to E2, Knight to E7, Castle. And we did transpose, uh, except instead of F3 or A4, with the lines we were looking at... In the other position, white played queen c2. So if white's queen was on d1 and pawn on a4, then we have my game against Ali Reza yep. and so on. Yep. So here Ding decided to play a5, which uh, you can also play knight to h5. It's a fine move, but a5, like this is the first, second line of computers, knight h5, a5. Yep. And the computer also likes to move a6. Mm -hmm. It thinks all these moves are decent. So I, a6 looks a bit funny because what are you doing with this move? But... To me, the most direct approach is knight h5. Uh, I can't imagine there's anything wrong with this move, but I'm sure that Ding has prepared something and probably knows a position better than, than I do. And in fact, he's played a5 before. Mm -hmm. He played it against Anish Giri, right? Yes. Uh, so, a5. And this was, Jan in played... fact, the game that they discussed it during the uh, post-game conference. Uh, Anish, uh, on the Chess.com broadcast, was uh, discussing the game as well. And it felt like uh, Jan was also very much aware of that game uh, during the press conference. It seems like they both had an idea of the position. So what is the idea of A5? I think the idea is basically that you want to prepare B5. But you don't want to play it right away. Because b5 at the moment would be rather committal. And would be met, I think, by a4. I'll move 11. Uh, mm -hmm. 11 b5, 12, b, uh, 12 a4. 12 a4, b4. Black is likely to play b4. And then knight a2 comes. And the knight will maneuver from a2 to c1 to b3. Although the knight on a2 is very poor, the knight on b3 would actually be an outpost. Mm -hmm. And a very strong one. Mm -hmm. And so probably here white gets some advantage. So... Black is preparing b5, waiting for white's move, and then seeing if maybe b5 makes more sense next move. Makes sense. So that's why Jan played a3. He's discouraging b5. b5 is, of course, a decent move here, but it no longer would come with the idea of b4 because white would be ready to capture on b4. Yeah. That being said, b5 is one of the top moves of the engine after a3, and uh, it, leads, it would lead to a very, very different type of position than the one we saw in the game. Yeah. Uh, so b5 was an option here. Instead, Ding played knight to h5, which is also what he did against Giri, mm -hmm. still following that game. Knight h5, take on e7, queen e7. So the point of knight h5 was the bishop on e7 was in a bit of a strange spot. It didn't, it didn't want to be on e7 because it obstructs the rook on e8. But if it drops back, then black's knight on f6 is pinned. So black decided to resolve that tension by trading the bishops. And the knight on h5 is temporarily rather poorly placed, but it will at some point come back to f6. And this is a position where time is not the most important factor because it's a rather closed position. The only time factor here is can white achieve f3, e4 in time. And usually we have to say the truth is that he cannot achieve f3, e4 before black can, um, can usually strike in the center with c5. Mm -hmm. So now, after queen e7, Nyan plays rook a t1. And this is an idea I know very well myself because I've played this idea very often. For example, I've played it uh, in a World Cup game. Um, I've played it in some blitz games, and maybe not in this position, but in similar positions. White plays rook a d1. Rook a d1 is supporting the e3 pawn. And someday, white may 
um, use the E file, right? Yes. The bigger idea is to play knight to C1, knight to B3, and then follow it up with F3. So now the knight has moved, and F3 uh, will not drop the E3 pawn, and then try to get E4 in the long term. E4, open the rooks, and get an attack against the king side and the center. Black played knight to F8. Mm -hmm. Good move. Usually the knight is uh, is better. First of all, it's opening up the bishop, and very often it's going to E6, and on E6 it will support C5. It might even someday jump to G5. It, it attacks the D4 pawn, which makes it much harder for white to achieve E4 as well. Knight to C1. This is also the typical plan we just mentioned, right? Yes. Knight to F6. Black could have also started with knight to E6, but basically these two moves, knight F6 and knight E6, will come in some move order, one or the other. F3. Now white is uh, is already ready for E4, right? Very close. So black, black plays knight to E6 to stop E4. E4 is met by knight takes D4, so you cannot do that yet. Still following the game, Geary Ding. So Ding knew this position very well. It's funny Here, because up to this point, Ding spent almost an hour on his clock. About 50 minutes he spent. Yeah, this is quite interesting. Although we have to say that this game against Geary, it was an online game. Maybe it wasn't taken as seriously as if it was, let's say, a super tournament over the board game by Ding. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's an interesting um, theme because in both games, they play different moves here, Jan and, and, uh, and Geary. But each move they played would have been best met by one move. But in both cases, Ding played another move. Mm -hmm. And it was the same move. Mm -hmm. So first, let's look at what Geary did. He played queen to f2. Queen f2 is a very simple idea. I want to play e4 at some point, and I'm defending the d4 pawn. Uh, right now it's via x-ray, but after white plays e4, it will be directly defending the d4 pawn. Yes. And after queen to f2, black played c5, white played bishop to b5, and black played rook to d8. Instead of c5, the best move according to the engine was to play b5. And this is very uh, the same idea. Black is basically preparing b4 and discouraging white any action in the center because if white uh, takes some action in the center, black will at some point play b4, chase the knight away from the defense of the center, and then use that to attack white's center. Mm -hmm. And after b5, the computer likes white's position very much. Instead, in the game, uh, Geary got some sort of advantage, which looks super, super like the position we got in, in today's game. Mm -hmm. Like, really, really similar. So, that was the game Geary... Uh, Geary Ding. Let's see what we got in today's game. Knight e2. Knight 1 to e2, which Knight 1 to e2 is basically saying I want to play Knight g3 at some point. Uh, and then I want to play Queen f2 probably, and I want to try to play e4, and then I may jump into f5. So here, uh, Ding played c5, very similar to his game against Geary. But again, the best move was b5. Uh, this is like not, it's not like c5 is a terrible move. It's just that. The, the most accurate is b5. Mm -hmm. After b5, probably he was more worried about knight to g3 than anything else. And then here, black has a number of good moves, but the nicest one, I think, is to play rook to b8. And basically, you're trying to follow it up with, at some point, c5 or b4 followed by c5, and the rook on b8 will support those pawn pushes. Mm -hmm. And if white plays knight to f5, after queen to f8, this knight looks a bit scary, but it's actually not doing particularly much there. And black will be ready for c5 very soon. So one thing we should notice about the position is that you shouldn't be afraid of tucking the queen on f8 like this. This is a very viable plan in, in this case. Yeah, one important point of the queen on f8 is, for example, if white plays e4 here, and now maybe white's happy. I, I put my knight on f5, it defends d4, and now I have e4. But because of the queen on f8, black can play g6. And white cannot capture on h6 because the queen is there to defend. Mm -hmm. And this position ends up being rather complex. After the move e5, and I fully understand why someone might not want to go for this, but e5, knight to d7, knight to d6, and very importantly, concretely, black can play knight takes d4, queen to f2, looks like double attack, e8 and d4, but now rook takes e5. And although it remains complicated in this position, it actually works out for black. Once again, we see the action of the queen on f8 targeting the knight on d6. Very, uh, very well placed piece. And one final detail, after knight takes c8 here, it looks like white will win a piece. But black has this move, queen c5. Hmm. And actually white does end up up a piece in the end, but black will have a million pawns for it. Yeah. And, okay, this, this is very com complicated stuff, and I fully understand why 
I, th I think you could play b5, but you probably wouldn't play rook to b8 after knight g3. Maybe you would play b4 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but rook to b8, allowing knight f5 and e4 and all this stuff, yeah, you might be scared to go for it. Yeah. That being said, it was a very good approach for black. Instead, Ding played c5, which was a little bit inaccurate and actually could have led to a rather nasty little position if Jan had played the most dangerous move here. Which is? So, the best move, and I think there's two quite decent moves. The best move is knight to f4. Mm. And it looks unusual because you allow the doubling of your f-pawns, knight f4, e f4. But as is kind of known from uh, similar positions, these f-pawns are not bad. And the more important thing is that, let's say white's, black's queen moves to f8. White plays dc5, queen c5, and queen to f2. And the more important point, besides the f-pawns, is black's d-pawn is a very long-term weakness. Mm -hmm. And also very importantly, the a5-pawn is creating an outpost on b5. So let's say queen takes f2, king f2. White has a very comfortable advantage in the endgame. And the f-pawns are actually not a hindrance at all. They could even be very useful in case one white someday plays g4 and tries to pawn storm on the king side. So these pawns are not just doubled and doing nothing. They're actually very useful pawns. Yeah. And the white will, will slowly target this d5 pawn. For example, bishop to d7, white may trade rooks, not force, but white may, mm -hmm. followed by rook to d1. And then white may play bishop to b1, followed by bishop to a2, putting the maximum amount of pressure and at some point, white may play g4 to try to chase away that knight on f6 with g5. So these are sort of um, typical plans. Yeah. And that's why after knight f4, black is well advised not to take on f4, but instead to play, for example, c takes d4, e takes d4. Now you need to deal with the threat to d-pawn. And if queen to d6, there's, there's some kind of knight b5 tricks in some point, so black may play queen to d8. Mm -hmm. White takes on e6. Black can take either one of two ways. But let's say bishop takes. And then white plays this rather pleasant position. And the reason for white's advantage here is because uh, the bishops, white's bishop is more active than black's, and the a5 pawn creates a potential outpost on b5. Yes. That being said, it's a very small advantage. But it's a very comfortable one, especially if you're up in the match. It's a very pleasant one to play. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Play for two results, psychologically, uh, very, very appealing for Jan. Yeah. I don't think you're super scared as black because you're so solid. Knight on f6 is, is not getting chased away by anything. The pawn on d5 is securely defended. The d4 pawn uh, is a bit weaker than the d5 pawn, you could say, because white's bishop cannot defend it while black's bishop can defend the pawn on d5. Mm -hmm. So, okay, it's it's between slightly better and equal for black, but you really would like to play this with white. It's a yes. pleasant position. Yes. Um, the other move besides knight f4 is there's a very simple move, queen to d2. And queen to d2 is, is very... Uh, it's not like preparing anything special. It's just basically the queen on d2 defends e3. It puts more pressure on d4, so it's a useful move. And at some point, black will probably play cd4, getting the posi similar position to what we just saw. If black ever plays c4, this is a disastrous mistake because white just draws a bishop back to c2, follows it up with e4, and without the pressure on the d4 pawn, white is just steamrolling black in the center. Mm -hmm. So two decent moves, um, knight to f4 or queen, queen d2. To d2. Yes. Both are basically uh, very similar, although knight to f4 is, it looks a bit trickier maybe, let's say. Mm -hmm. Instead, Jan played bishop to b5. It's actually very similar to what uh, what Giri did, so we're seeing <laughs> almost a, a complete echo of that position. I, I feel but, he was taking some inspiration from, from that game as well. Perhaps it was something unexpected to, this, to see this type of uh, positions for Jan, and then he was just following it up with um, the comfort zone that he knew, that game between Ding and Anish. It could also it could just be that they're just very natural moves and uh, strong players true. tend to think in similar ways. Yep. So rook d8, d c5, queen c5, queen to d2. It's already uh, white has spoiled any tiny advantage that that he might have had with this with this bishop b5 d c5 concept. Mm -hmm. Bishop d7, excellent move by Ding. Although d4 is probably also equalizing, but there white is the only one who can be better. So Bishop d7 is, is a nicer move because it's keeping a bit more tension in the position. Mm -hmm. And after bishop d7, Jan took. If he wanted to equalize, I don't know why he didn't just play knight d4 immediately. And the position, I mean, knight, like, I don't know why you take on d7. Knight d4 is just more natural. And if knight takes d4, e takes d4, or a queen d4 as well. I mean, you have maybe the tiniest of advantages after, after knight d4, queen d4. Although it is, yeah, it, it is basically equal. Yeah. But 
you'd rather be white. While after bishop d7, actually, Jan started to drift a little bit into a slightly worse position. Mm -hmm. And this was the Ding. moment that um, felt uh, like a big surprise for Jan. Ding took with the knight on d7, and it felt, and I believe it was confirmed during the press conference as well, this was a complete shock for Jan. Mm -hmm. Jan only considered rook takes d7 for whatever reason. Yeah, well, rook d7, and then he wanted to play knight d4, knight d4 and play, yeah. play a tiny, tiny, it's similar to other positions, it's similar to the Geary game, uh, it's basically equal, but if you pick one side or the other, you're probably going to pick white. No, knight d7 came as a complete shock for, for Jan. And it's, it's a brilliant move. So it, the shock would only be not because you don't understand the move, but because you just didn't consider it because it leaves d5 hanging. Yes. And you think, oh, d5 is hanging. Of course, queen d5 is uh, is just bad because you take on e3, right? And then you follow it up with knight c5, and although the material is equal, white's queen starts to get kicked around. Mm -hmm. And if white plays knight takes d5, this is even worse. It just drops a piece to knight b6. And if white's king was on h1, you could play e4, but because the king is not on e, uh, the king is is on g1, the pawn is pinned on e3. You cannot play e4, and you just lose that pinned knight on d5. Mm -hmm. And why is knight on d7 better than on f6? That's the real question. It's not a, It's not about the tactical point that you can't take on d5. It's about the point that the knight on d7 is coming into b6 or e5 and into c4. And one very important positional point, if white's a3 pawn was on a2, white could easily meet any of these knight b6 ideas with b3. And you just stop that whole knight c4, and then you get ready for your own knight d4 and blockading the d-pawn and so on. Mm -hmm. But... With the pawn a3, you can never play b3 without dropping the a3 pawn. Mm -hmm. And that is an annoying but very important tactical detail. That is... I feel I'm getting a master class right now. <laughs> so Great. that's why Jan played knight d4. Yes. Knight to b6 came, excellent move. The knight is coming to c4. Jan played rook to d1. He saw that you could meet knight c4 with queen f2. Rook to d1... A little bit surprising because it, it uh, basically you can also do the same thing with rook to c1, rook c1, knight c4, queen f2, and compared to the game, there's no kind of knight takes a3 ideas here, mm -hmm. and the position is basically still completely equal to my eye. Yes. Instead, rook d1, knight c4, queen f2, and suddenly there are these knight takes a3 ideas, including at the moment. Like he could have played knight takes a3 here. So why would you play rook d1? I'm not 100% sure I understand it. Um, Knight takes a3 temporarily wins a pawn, but white does have the important resource here, e4. And because of his e4, and because d takes e4 is not possible, because knight takes e6, tra forces a trade of queens, and then suddenly the knight on e3 actually does fall, mm -hmm. uh, white will regain the pawn on d5. Mm -hmm. And white equalizes like this. So, although white equalizes like this, it's still strange to me that you would you would go for it um, because rook c1 doesn't really have a downside. Mm -hmm. So the only downside I can think of now that I like see the position is, um, but it's, it's not a, it's an, it's a downside, which is easy to get past. It's like 23 move rook c1, knight c4, queen f2, right? Mm -hmm. There is a move knight takes e3 here, mm -hmm. which temporarily wins a pawn. But uh, first of all, it's a piece sacrifice. I don't think black would go for it. And, even if white wants to be super safe, white can take on e6, f e6, knight takes d5, forcing queen takes d5, and queen takes e3, and white has restored material balance and can only be the tiniest bit better. Because of the so, on e6, yes. Yeah, why he played rook d1, I'm I'm not sure. It's it's not a very logical moment for Jan. But okay, rook d1, knight c4, queen f2. Ding played a good move here, but the computer suggests a absolutely surprising move to my eye. Which is the move on um, move twenty four b five, b five. Whoa. Okay, there are some tactical resources behind this. You cannot take with a d pawn because knight takes c three. That would be problematic. Can you take with the c knight? Yeah. Um, yeah, you absolutely can. Uh, knight c b five, and then suddenly there's there's a four. Ooh, what is this? So the idea of a4 is that once I try to get back with my knight, knight c3, let's say, now you just target me on the b file. So you're basically using the b pawn as a decoy. Okay, you you take the extra pawn 
and I'm going to play for initiative and take advantage of the fact that you don't have a good way to defend that B2 pawn. Yeah, There's I mean... no rook D2 because the rook is misplaced on D1. Once again, we see with the rook on C1, you could potentially think of ideas of rook to C2 and defend on the second rank. With the rook on D1, you cannot do that. Of course, uh, white is very, very likely to be fine here. I mean, I would never even consider this B5, knight C, B5, A4. That's, I don't even know if... Uh, that's alien chess. Yeah, it's very, very strange. And, and for sure, it, it only leads to an equal position. But, and most people, if you said this position is equal, they might even be surprised. They might think, okay, white's up a pawn and somehow it's better after knight C3. But knight C3, there is this like either rook DB8, but even you can play rook AB8, knight A4, queen A5. And because tactically... White's uh, pieces are hanging a bit. Mm -hmm. It turns out that uh, that black is the only one who can be better, although objectively it is equal, yeah. right? Yeah. So b5 was a funny resource, but I, I like Ding's move, rook a to c8. That feels very natural, yes. So knight to a4. Basically, rook a c8 is threatening. Now knight takes b2. That's the main threat. Mm -hmm. And white has to deal with that threat. And this whole, like, rook c1... Now you'd just be losing time, right? And potentially even allowing knight takes e3 under much better circumstances. Yes. So Jan played a good move, knight to a4. Trying to deal tactically with uh, with the problems. Yes. The queen goes back to e7 because it doesn't have many squares it can go to. Because these knights on d4 and a4, they actually control a lot of squares. So the queen can't go to b5, for example. It can't go to b6 and so on. So queen to e7, good move. Rook f to e1. Good move as well. Good defensive move. Already, uh, Jan is in territory because the knight on c4 is such a strong piece. Targets e3, targets b2, targets a3. Cannot be kicked by b3, as we already mentioned. That white is under pretty serious pressure. But mm -hmm. Jan finds the best move, which is rook f2, e1. Yeah. And here, if there was a chance to play for an advantage for black, it was at this moment. Okay. Critical moment. Mm -hmm. So I, I checked a little bit about what black's options are. So first, there is a tactical option. The tactical option is, is queen to e8. Queen to e8 is forcing the knight back to c3. It has nowhere else to go to. Yes. And then black captures on a3. And this is actually a clear pawn. You are winning a clear pawn with this method. If white takes on a3, rook c3, black is simply a pawn up. Yes. White has a very uh, strong uh, dynamic way to play for compensation, which is a move knight to f5. Instead of taking five on is super a3. Strong. Yeah, instead of taking on i3. 9 on 5 is super strong, and the pawn on d5 is attacked. So after knight to f5, uh, it's possible Ding reached this position in, in his calculations and thought, why does white to, has too much compensation? Black has a move rook c5 here, which defends the pawn on d5. And here, I think if Ding had gone for this, it would have been a, a test of, uh, of Jan's form for sure. Because mm. the position is objectively equal, but the move that the computer likes for white is a move knight to d4 which is very very unusual to me Not because e4 the came... e4 is 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 the main thing that comes to my mind knight to e4 you said no e4 after rook to c5 Not to e4 no <laughs> just just, yeah, uh, just e4 yeah pawn to e4 is possible it's not a bad move it's actually met with this like really strong knight c2 Oof. queen c2 d4 okay and and black is getting some sort of slight advantage even though white regains the pawn that's uh, ridiculous. Black will, black will regain the knight, probably after knight takes d4. And the material will be equal, but because black has better pieces and the queen side majority, black has a slight advantage. Okay, this rook c5, sort of... knight c2 is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, and that being said, after rook c5, white has other moves. Um, for example, queen to g3 is a very natural move, I think. And after queen g3, probably king to f8. To start, knight takes h6. And this is a messy position. I'm not saying that this was a good choice for Ding. It's it's a choice. It's a possible choice, which would lead to a complete mess. But if, like, let's say he was trying to win this game desperately, then this might have been the way to, to try to do so. And I think mentally he's not at that point yet. He's not in desperado mode. No, by no means am I saying it was the right choice or that he has any need to be desperate. It was just an interesting way to keep the game going. Absolutely. It was also 26 knight takes d4 is interesting. And it would pose a a little bit of uh, a choice for Jan. Do you take with the pawn or do you take with the rook? Computer says one is much better than the other. But from a human point of view, I'm not sure it's super obvious that e takes d4 
black plays queen to f6 and has a annoying edge, certainly an annoying edge, but it's not obvious to my eye that uh, black is actually better here. But mm -hmm. the computer is giving an evaluation which suggests uh, white is in some uncomfortable uh, trouble. It must be specifically because of this knight, very powerful knight on c4, ideas of maybe rook to e8, take advantage of the e3 square, which is weakened. Yeah. And the pressure, the very nagging pressure by the queen from f6 towards the pawn on d4. Yeah, it's it's purely um, concrete stuff, but it's based on things like knight c3, knight takes a3, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. And even if white regains the pawn, knight d5, rook d5, b a3, black has the... Uh, Let's say black plays b5. Black has the queen side majority. The a possibility to create a pass pawn is is very valuable in this position. Mm -hmm. Although again, objectively, we are talking about a, a drawn position where black is practically uh, in a more comfortable position. Yes. After knight d4, better is rook takes d4, and this would be this would be a little bit of a sharp position. B5, knight to c3, queen to c5. Again, with kind of knight takes b2 ideas, and then white has. White has various ways to play this. Um, the kind of computer way, which I think people might not be attracted to, is b4. Mm -hmm. Difficult move to make, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. The maybe human way is after queen c5, you calculate the move rook e to d1. And rook e to d1 is forcing an endgame. Knight takes b2, queen b2, queen c3, queen c3, rook c3, rook d5. All the pieces are getting vacuumed off. Rook d5, rook d5. Rook e3, rook b5, rook a3. Black is up a pawn. But it's one of those kind of typical white plays h4, puts the rook on the seventh rank and makes a draw like this. Mm -hmm. uh, so pawn down, but it, it is kind of known as like a, a re relatively simple draw. It's it's so, simple, but it's not the simplest, right? Because of this uh, pawn on f3. Normally, you would like to have the pawn on f2 and create this pawn chain with g3 and h4. I don't know if it changes much because you can play king h2, g3 and get your king out that way. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's... Uh, it's still a difficult decision. It's like, you know it's draw, but it, to make the decision to go for an endgame where you have to defend for a long time is still a difficult decision to make. Yes. So, anyway, uh, it, it would have been better if you wanted to try for a win. Like, that would have been a safe way to try for a win, let's yes. say. Yes, yes. I think that would have been perfectly safe. Queen e8 was kind of the crazy way to try for a win if you want to really uh, play some messy positions. Yeah. Instead, Dink played queen to f6. And he might have actually thought this is a very dangerous move because uh, he is trying to play knight takes d4, but under better circumstances, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But Jan played a very nice move, knight to b5. And the point of knight b5 is now after knight a to c3, you no longer have knight b2 tricks. You no longer have knight a3 tricks because my knight on b5 is defending everything. And mm -hmm. obviously we, we mentioned before that knight on b5 is an outpost. Black's pawn cannot go to a6 to chase it away. Ding played knight to c7. Trying to trade knights, mm -hmm. knights d4, and we saw a repetition of the position: knight e6, knight b5, knight c7, knight d4, knight e6, and draw was agreed based on threefold repetition. Yeah, yeah. Wow, what a game! It looked simple, uh, given the let's say limited material nature of the position with the bishops no longer on the board, the pawn structure. It felt like it favors white with the isolated queen's pawn, but as we already have seen and as you just masterfully explain uh, it was in fact black who uh, was on not necessarily the verge of winning but on the verge of potentially getting some dynamic play and some dynamic chances in the position um a summary of round three at least from my perspective psychologically definitely a positive round for for uh, ding uh the things that i'm looking at and I've been looking at uh, at the press conference as well is, first of all, his confidence um, in his play. It definitely felt like he knew the positions very well. He was uh, confident with the positions. He was uh, not necessarily feeling pressured with the black pieces. So definitely a positive from that regard for uh, Ding. Also a very good point he made. Um, and we kind of understood this as we were going through the motions of the first two games. Ding had some mental problems. In fact, he said it at the press conference that they were considering uh, bringing a doctor to deal with his uh, mental uh, breakdown almost. It felt like a mental breakdown. But he also said that his friends during the rest day and his support group that is with him there uh, in Astana managed 
to get him back into the game. Now he feels comfortable. Now, now he feels comfortable with the stage. And this is another thing that uh, we could see uh, in the first couple of games. He was almost never at the board. It felt like he had stage fright. He didn't want to be there. Uh, he was always in his restroom, you know, uh, with his jacket on. Definitely some anxiety. You know, you get cold when you have that anxiety. Today's thing was a much more confident thing. And that is definitely a positive. From Jan's perspective, mm, I have to say uh, I'm looking for signs of frustration. I'm not seeing them because this is generally when Jan starts to become a um, completely different player. Whenever he starts feeling frustrated, whenever he tastes uh, defeat, things of that nature, we're not seeing that. So a very stable, a very neutral uh, game for Jan. How do you see the psychological state of these two players right now after this game? Yeah, I think this was sort of the calm after the storm, let's say. Uh, so we had the very violent second game. We had a rest day, and then this was a very level game. Neither side really had serious... I mean, yeah, maybe Ding, Nepo was... Uh, Jan was at some point a bit better. Ding was at some point a bit better, but nothing that was nearing... Uh, you know, the sort of advantage that you need to beat a top player, right? Maybe Ding could have pressed a bit more, maybe Jan could have played a bit more accurately, but it was a very calm, stable game. And from Jan's point of view, it's not bad. I mean, he's still ahead in the match, and that's that's a very good situation. In a match, it's very simple. You just want to be ahead. There's not mm -hmm. much else. You, you Of course, it's better to be ahead by two. It's better to be ahead by three. It's better for the match to be over, but ahead is ahead. So he's in a good situation. For Ding, it's more about... Yeah, he just needs to uh, to get a bit more comfortable. And to remember, it's a long match. They've played three games, but uh, it's a 14-game match, right? And a lot will happen in those remaining uh, 11 games, assuming it goes the distance. So he still has no reason to despair. He just has to make sure that he feels like he can play chess because he'll get some chances. You don't play a full match without getting any chances. You might not get many because these days, of course, openings are rather rather tough to break through and players play very accurately and, and Jan doesn't make many mistakes. Uh, certainly not mistakes that uh, that usually lead to, you know, the sort of disasters, right? The sort of disaster that we saw in game two by Ding. That's, that's unusual for a top player to have that sort of um, game. So, but Ding will still get some chances. He can, he can be confident in that because uh, something will happen. He'll get some opening idea, which works out a little bit that he gets some sort of play and then, Jan is under pressure, and then that the only point is that Ding has to play well in those scenarios. So it's very important for him, and I can't speak to his psychological state. I don't know what's going on in his head. You know, people can say everything. He can look comfortable, but it's still, there's stuff going on in your head, and you don't know exactly how it affects you until the moves come on the board. So we don't know. We can't judge based on uh, how he's looking. But for sure, uh, you know, he, he seems to be in a better mood. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Then early on, we don't know if that means he'll play well. We don't know if that means he'll be ready for the match. Uh, but at least that's a good start, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Fabi, one more question uh, before we finish this. What do you expect from uh, Ding tomorrow? He had a bit of an accident in game one with the white pieces game two. That was when he played this move H3. It didn't work out for him. Do you expect... Um, a revision of that move h3 or a completely different thing no h3 will never be played again um <laughs> no he, nobody's playing h3 besides maybe in some title tuesday games. <laughs> it's I, the question is yeah it looks like ding is gravitating towards d4 openings for me it's like okay you could play the catalan and test yon out there i feel like if you prepare the catalan super super well you can find ideas even though there are a lot of good lines for black still it's it's a super rich opening, and that's why Magnus Carlsen chose it as his opening, not because the Catalan gives an advantage for it, certainly not, but because it's a rich opening to search for practical ideas. And so Catalan is definitely an option. And then the other thing is, would he want to test Jan out in knight f3, d5, knight c3, rather than h3, knight c3? But I, I don't think you need to really probe here, because I have a feeling that Jan prepared c5. Yes. And unless you have some ideas here, it probably doesn't make sense to ask the question. So the question is, does he have some ideas here? 
I really hope that Ding has bigger ideas than Naya 3 D5H3 because um, uh, I have to say not a super impressive idea the more I think about it. Um, yeah, it's 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 basically a throwaway idea. Um, we'll see. Catalan could certainly be an option. If right. I had to like, pick one, maybe Catalan. Maybe you would Catalan. go with the Catalan. Very interesting uh, ideas. Uh, once again, another masterclass. Thank you, uh, Fabi, for sharing your knowledge and your time with the channel and with the viewers. Um, thank you, and we'll see you again tomorrow with coverage of round four. Until then, see you guys, see you guys later. Bye-bye.